Young Turks. I'm Nomi Konst. We are here in New York where we're going to have a great conversation about political movements. Where do people go from here? Uh, there was just an election in the Democratic Party. Uh, some are expecting change, but probably not you know, overnight. There are many people who are talking about leaving the Democratic Party, starting new parties. The Democratic Socialists of America, their membership has grown astronomically over the past year. And this can all be related to the political revolution that's happening. There's a populist movement happening. Uh, there's people who are civically engaged. Engaged, there's the resistance. Well, I thought it would be great to talk about the work that people are doing. They've been doing it for years. And who are the players on the field right now organizing and building up this resistance, not just to take on Trump, but to reform the Democratic Party and progressive uh, movements across the country. And we're so lucky to have Nalini Stamp, who is the National Membership Director for the Working Families Party. They have a very strong force in New York. And uh, we're going to talk about some of the work that she's doing. Hey, Nalini. Hey, how you doing? Good. Thanks for having me. Definitely. So what's the Working Families Party? Yeah, the Working Families Party is an independent political organization, and in four states we actually have a ballot line using fusion voting where you can have one candidate on multiple ballot lines. Mm -hmm. um, and we are an organization that it has labor, community-based organizations, and individual members um, that want to do electoral work. We find, recruit, train, and identify, and want to elect the next generation of progressive leaders in this country. When was the party formed, and, and why? Mm -hmm. Why wasn't it just go to the Democratic Party? Yeah, um, the party was formed in 1998 in the state of New York. Um, again, New York has a great law, fusion laws, um, and it was formed to, to raise the minimum wage, actually. At the time, the federal minimum wage was about like 525 or 550, and New York State was 515, still not, <laughs> you know, not living wages for anyone. And the Democrats and Republicans at the time in the state of New York had a sweetheart deal. Um, the Republic, as long as the Republicans can control the Senate and the Democrats can control Sounds the assembly, so familiar. right? <laughs> control the assembly. <laughs> um, you know, things were really great, and we said that we're not really going to get a minimum wage raise unless we we create po independent political power. Mm -hmm. So that's for the Working Families was cre Party was created by a few labor um, organizations at the time and a few community-based organizations. What is their relationship with the Democratic Party uh, at the national level? Mm -hmm. At the national level, um, we kind of play more of an outsider. Uh, a game. In New York, we play inside and outside the party as well in states like Connecticut and Oregon um, where we have ballot lines as well, um, where we work with some Democrats. Some Democrats say that they you know, want to be on our ballot line only because they're kind of sick and tired of, of the party as it is. But our, our, our national relationship hasn't really gotten close. I was at the DNC's winter meeting mm -hmm. um, and it was like one of the first times we got invited in like a big, in a, in a big uh, show, in a big forum to have people learn from us, mm -hmm. um, but we really play outsiders. Like we were the folks who who helped do um, actions outside of Schumer's house when he wasn't voting right on the cabinet picks, mm -hmm. um, and that's what we want to do. You know, I, you know, play that outsider role, but also work with progressive Democrats like the Ellisons of the world mm -hmm. and like this and like Senator Warren. So here we are today. Um, you know, it's been uh, almost <laughs> twenty years since the party was formed, uh, and the Democratic Party. You know, I don't think this is debatable. It went in a very moderate direction for several years, even after the economic collapse. Mm -hmm. And WFP is a pretty progressive organization that represents labor. But labor, under Republican leadership um, and, and not strong enough and bold enough Democratic leadership, has been weakened quite a bit in the last decade. So how can an organization that's supported by labor grow in, the, in, in, in a moment when there is such an appetite for resistance, even against their own, you know, the more moderate members of the Democratic Party. What are you guys doing? Absolutely. We're doing something that I think the Democratic Party should learn. We're creating a more open source model for working families, which I've been working on. Um, we have these local branches, uh, which are groups of individuals that can adopt working families, charter with us, and have a name of the Working Families Party. We have three in, uh, three local branches in Nevada, um, up in Reno and uh, Washoe County and Carson City and Las Vegas, and we have a group in Columbus that's affiliated with us as well. Well. So we're actually learning from the times, learning from past mistakes, um, and learning for, for a vision of the future that we have, that we need to open up our model. We need to give people their own lists. We need to have a locally based model so folks can you know, fight back on their city, their county, their state. There's so many elections that happen out there, and oftentimes as a national movement, we're, we're always concerned with Congress and the Senate, which is important, but there's also 50 state legislators. <laughs> um, there's lots of county legislators across this country and a lot of municipalities as well. Are you willing to primary bad acting Democrats? 
Yeah, I mean, I think that we have a past of, of it's been a struggle, mm -hmm. right? It's something that we have struggled with with a long time um, within Working Families Party, but we have done it in the past. We've also run our own candidates. When Chish James, who is the public advocate of the city of New York, first ran, she ran against a, a, a Democrat, and yeah. it wasn't a primary. It was, it was we put her on our, our, our line only. So I think we're willing to do it. We still need to grow in mm -hmm. that and learn again from past mistakes, but it's something that we have shown a, both a track record for and some room for growth. So you talked about uh, organizing a protest outside of Senator Schumer's office. Mm -hmm. That to me is, is, is quite unusual for a party mm -hmm. to do, yeah. especially against their own party and their own party leadership, because I think a lot of folks uh, assume that they're beholden to the leadership and there's this arrangement that you don't touch your own, your own people. Mm -hmm. Uh, you're doing more of those things across the country. What kind of protests can people show up at if they if they yeah. want to send a message to their lawmakers? Yeah, so in December we launched Resist Trump Tuesdays, uh, which has been started off as an um, a anti-cabinet fight, right? Mm -hmm. uh, when Trump announced uh, Senator Sessions as the pick for Attorney General, mm -hmm. um, all of our insights turned outwards, and it was crazy, right? His record, his record on immigration, the racist comments he's had in the past, just you know, his record on voting rights in the state of Alabama, we were just like, this cannot happen. And so we wanted to make sure that Democrats were gonna have a spine because at first they were like, we're gonna stand up to Trump. And then all of a sudden in November and December, they were like, well, we'll work with him on 15 or 20% right. of the stuff, legitimizing him as a president. Claire right? McCaskill, I remember she notably <laughs> yeah. said, we're not listening to the Tea Party of the left. It's like, no, you're the Tea Party. <laughs> yeah. You're the minority that's that's holding the party hostage. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And so, so for us, like, you know, I mean, we had folks and individuals who were like, we want to do stuff. And we started listening to our list. We started listening to our base and saying, you want to do this? Let's give you the tools and resources to support you. So we've been doing Resist Trump Tuesdays. We've been doing these Sunday night calls that I've had upwards to 60,000 people on wow. them. Um, and we've been prepping folks to take action on Tuesdays at congressional offices, at senator offices. And it doesn't really matter what party they're from, if they're doing something that people believe is unjust, that people believe is not right, and if they're cooperating with the administration, we're telling folks to go and giving them the tools to do it. What does that mean? What kind of tools are yeah. you giving them? Totally. Well, one, we're giving them the, the know with all to where their like, Congress people <laughs> are, right? I mean, this is stuff yeah. that's not public and easy to find. Like their offices are usually on their website, the DC offices, right? Um, they don't have offices in every part of their district, right? So one, giving them where. Right. <laughs> That's a big, you know, big case. Two, telling them when they're home and when they're not. The congressional recesses, right? Telling them when they're actually home. Telling them what days of the week they're home, mm -hmm. right? What days of the week they're in office, right? Giving them the tools like um, there was this awesome town hall tracker that was created by yeah. people and we were right. and what we did was we uploaded that to a map and said here are all uh, of the actions. Are RSVP for one, right? Um, we've been giving them trainings, telling them how to bird dog, how to... What is bird dog? Bird dogging is when you uh, follow around a candidate. Um, we had a really good one, um, our Rhode Island working families, um, when you follow a candidate, basically, in a, in a safe manner, um, and you show up to their events and you disrupt them. Um, like Elected officials, when they go home, they love doing public events. They love kissing babies. They love cutting ribbons. They love having spaghetti dinners, as what we saw uh, with Senator Whitehouse um, and our Rhode Island working families party going and demanding and having a letter saying, you have to say no to all of these picks after he had um, approved, uh, well, voted yes on uh, Mike Pompeo right. uh, being CIA director and they came and they got him to come outside the spaghetti dinner and read every single cabinet pick that he was saying no to yeah. so we you know we give the tools and we were giving a lot of like fact sheets about cabinet members I mean for me this is the first time in my life that the cabinet picks were like at people knew them right my mother knows who Rex Tillerson is like I don't know if she knew every secretary of state that has that has that has come across so I think we you know we were able to publicize it and also make it accessible for people in their community well, the stakes are so high now, and I think it's it's with the information out there, the tools, mm -hmm. um, organizations that have the platforms already to engage citizens. It's it's the prime opportunity for a citizenry to step up and and voice their opposition and become engaged. Mm -hmm. I mean, we see it at the local level, we see it at the national level, and of course, Democrats don't have much representation, or the majority is really anywhere. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it's you know this is this is really great work. So uh, if if I want to organize a protest of my local elected official, 
um, you provide these resources. How do I get people there? What, what, how does somebody organize? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, we have this whole toolkit on resisthere.org, uh, which is a, a open source kind of resistance mm -hmm. uh, website that we've been providing. Here's how to plan an action. Like, here's how to get together with your friends and have a planning meeting for an action, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then here's, how to, here's the steps to do an action. Here's what you can say. Here's what you can do. And what we give folks on resisthere.org is a map so that they can, and an easy tool, so that they can put their information, put the location, and we'll always email our list that is in that locality. So it allows folks to, to, to use our tools that we already have to reach not only their friends, but a broader set of people, give them a link, give them easy access to it. And also sometimes what we've been doing at, when folks have been disrupting congressional town halls is giving them the keys to our, our Facebook. We learned this from the people wow. of For Bernie, um, which is a great, you know, has been a great platform. Um, organizing around Bernie where we just tell them hey here we'll give, give you admin access for the day so you can live stream your Facebook uh, town hall and, mm -hmm. and, and live stream it for other people to see and get inspired by so those are some of the things that, you know and, and for me I think it's get together with your friends get together yeah. with people that you know and say hey you want to organize you want to you want to you want to join me on this March you want to join mm -hmm. me on this letter writing campaign you want to join me on any kind of easy step and it's always great to do it with people that you that you love, that you're comfortable with. And you know, I, I have like text messages loops with people that I organize actions with so that we can keep each other up to date. On the other hand, there's been a lot of pushback. Uh, it's not just the right wing. This, this is an old messaging, uh, the, the messaging, I guess, strategy of the right wing has been to say, all these protesters are being paid. Um, <laughs> you know, George Soros is paying for these people to show up. I've noticed that there are even those on the left now who are starting to buy into this rhetoric. I, I, somehow it bleeds over. Mm -hmm. Can we use this as an opportunity to, to talk about what's true and what's false? Yeah, absolutely. So organizations that exist out there um, definitely do fundraising from you know foundations across the board, right? Um, people work at organizations and institutions. I don't think that someone paid uh, millions of people globally to show up on the Women's March. Um, <laughs> I didn't get my paycheck. Right. I'm still waiting. I didn't get my paycheck for <laughs> going to the Women's March. I don't think that people paid um, a bunch of immigrants to take a day off. And in fact, people got retaliated That's on bad. that from the, from the workplace. And I don't think that people are getting paid to, to organize the science march, right? Yeah. <laughs> scientists are scientists and they right. want to organize their own marches. So I think we have to be realistic with, yes, there are organizations out there that get foundation support um, mm -hmm. for the work that they do on issues and, and organizing. But the reality is, is that people are, are furious. People are upset. Um, yes, a lot of it is about the Trump administration, but also what, I mean, not just like what the rhetoric was in the campaign, but what they've been doing since the Muslim ban, the refugee ban, right? The, um, the uh, attacks on undocumented people that a lot of folks are saying this is not new, right? right. Um, Obama de uh, deported two million people. Uh, he was known as the deporter in chief, right? And so I think that, you know, there is definitely a, there's a level that I think people just don't want to hear that folks are angry and that these are that people are acting because this is what it was in the 60s, 70s and the 80s people were acting in their communities, in their clubs, in their book clubs, you know, in their democratic clubs. And we're seeing this again because there's such a widespread of anger. There's such a widespread of of shame. I mean, folks are I mean, this is kind of the first time I ever like actually embraced the word America because I I am just I'm just so I'm so disappointed. Yeah. Um, and so I think that for, for me, it's kind of like, I know a lot of folks say, oh, Soros, Soros. I think a lot of that is anti-Semitism that's coming from the right wing. Um, and th there has been really terrible stuff said about uh, George Soros. But at the end of the day, like there, again, I don't know, unless I, like all these women across the globe got paychecks and right. the men who stood with us, I, I'm gonna just put that as a, as, as a big fit there. <laughs> it, it, it just seems ridiculous, because of course, you know, when you look at foundations, a lot of wealthy individuals and, and just everyday individuals mm -hmm. will give money to foundations and organizations so that they can, you know, provide the assistance, like the trainings and mm -hmm. the tools necessary mm -hmm. to organize. Mm -hmm. That's how organizations work. Yeah. Does that mean they're busing in millions of people as actors? <laughs> yeah, no. no. That's no. not, you know, this isn't like a Roger Stone sort of situation. Right. That's his track record. Right. Um, something really horrible happened in New York. Uh, mm -hmm. You had, you know, with, with this climate where you have people organizing and doing great things and pushing back and shaming their lawmakers, you also have a rise in, in hate speech mm -hmm. and, and hateful actions mm -hmm. and we saw that take place in New York. Tell, tell us what happened. Yeah, um, well on Monday, um, uh, Timothy Kaufman uh, stumbled into the Midtown um, South Precinct in Manhattan with a stab wound um, and died 
And on Wednesday, um, a man by the name of James Jackson um, walked into the same precinct and said that he murdered um, Timothy. Um, and Timothy was a man who, at least on Twitter, I saw was like happy that he voted. He said at his tweet on election day was like, I'm so glad I voted, I love America. Oh. Um, he took a picture in front of fences with a I voted fo photo. Um, well, I voted a sticker and, and, and it, the guy said, the man who, who took a bus from Baltimore to do this, he said he took it because New York City is the media capital of the world and that he, won, he, he had the intention, um, police said that he had the intention to kill black folks for 10 years now. Um, so this is not anything new, um, but I believe that we are seeing high acts of terror. These are domestic acts of terror. Mm -hmm. These are terrorist acts um, because of the era of Trump, because of the era of white supremacists and mm -hmm. the alt-right, <laughs> um, mm -hmm. but let's call it what it really is. Um, because folks like Milo are able to say these, these things to the public and incite violence. Like a lot of times we're gonna say, oh, the left incites violence. Actually, when you say that people, that a whole group of people don't belong in this country, that they're rapists, that when you say that black folks are lazy, that's inciting violence. Yeah. And we saw that this week. And you know, the man, he, he was proud. He wanted this to happen. He wanted his name to be known everywhere. And, I, and, you know, and we're standing up, we're having an action on, on tomorrow at 6 p.m. Um, at Union Square to say, you know, no hate crimes here. Also, it, like, anti-Semitic hate crimes have gone up in New York City like, about, like, not over 90%. This is, this, is, this is something to be taken seriously, and it's something to act upon. We can't just have, oh, well, this is, like, a, a press release and a, a press statement. We need to really make sure that our communities feel safe and are safe without over-policing. So what can leaders do, uh, you say, without over-policing? Yeah. You know, th these are people who are feeling emboldened by the rhetoric that they see in the mainstream now. That now they can come out and say these things, and some may not have even felt them before, but mm -hmm. you know there was a little touch of it, and now mm -hmm. it's expanded on. There's mm -hmm. a community mm -hmm. that is supporting this hateful speech. Mm -hmm. uh, hopefully not in New York, but you know, for people who are not used to being in diverse communities, I think you hear a little bit more of that. But I think when you see New York, in particular, Queens, um, the Bronx, the most diverse communities in the world mm -hmm. have hate crime. Mm -hmm. That's what really wakes people up. So what can leaders do, you know, especially leaders in these communities who aren't used to, to mm -hmm. seeing these things happen on the streets of New York? Yeah, I mean, I think that we need to figure out how do we do community protection, um, whether that means folks talking to each other and doing some community defense work, meaning that either people are patrolling their, com their own communities and that have networks and phone trees and um, just different ways. I'm thinking about when tenants used to get evicted yeah. in the 70s in the Lower East Side. There were phone trees and people calling each other and saying, there's an eviction coming, so people right. were protecting themselves. So how do we do that, right? I mean, we're not gonna be able to do that all the time, yeah. um, but how do we create those? Um, DRUM, um, which is an organization that is out of Jackson Heights, has been doing these hate-free zones mm -hmm. where they, you know, go into, they go to a community where a lot of their members live and they say we're declaring this as a hate free zone and have community members multiracial community members come together and pledge to, to each other that that their homes are sanctuaries that their houses are sanctuaries that their store their grocery stores are sanctuaries we need to expand what we mean by sanctuary yeah. um, because I think sanctuary sometimes means oh well the co cops won't you know work with the feds but for me sanctuary is not more cops in in my community for me sanctuary is knowing that if I feel unsafe I can go into my neighbor's house and ring the doorbell and say I'm sorry to disturb you but I really need this sanctuary right now to me that's saying I can go to a grocery store and say somebody's been following me don't call the cops yet but can I stay here for a little bit even if I don't have money to pay for something Ooh. so I think that's what we need to have is like the beloved community um, where we're protecting each other and defending one another in these ways of saying here open open your doors I love that that's brilliant uh, for folks who don't have WFP in their communities uh, you know some of these states that you don't represent mm -hmm. how can they get more engaged with WFP and 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 pick up on the work that you've been doing and learn from um, you know, the trainings and you know, without having to fly to New York to do so. Totally. Um, well, people can uh, definitely go to resisthere.org or workingfamilies.org. Um, we have a sign up link for folks who specifically either want to do resistance work or electoral work in their communities. We'll follow up with folks that we can. We'll invite folks to these Sunday calls. That's a really easy step. Every, mostly every Sunday besides 
you know, Super Bowl Sunday and like, uh, you know, Easter Sunday. And we have these phone calls that people can pick up on, learn some tips. Every Sunday we try to give a couple of tips and then also some actionable items, right? So those are like some, some, some really starter ways to get involved. Um, we're gonna be launching a starter guide soon of how to do electoral action and, and electoral organizing that we're gonna make really public. So folks can do that and carry the banner of the Working Families Party in their neighborhood. Last question I ask all organizers. Mm -hmm. Who is your favorite organizer? What was your favorite book uh, that taught you how to be a great organizer? Mm -hmm. um, whew, that's a hard question. Yeah. Um, I could say there's two who are uh, who taught me. Not necessarily a favorite book, but um, Fannie Lou Hamer and Ella Baker are two people that I, I extremely look up to. Ella Baker believed in um, leadership that was local. Mm -hmm. Ella Baker believed in um, decentralized leadership, that there wasn't just one leader, but that we were leaderful. We're not leaderless, we're leaderful. Um, and she always inspired the people who came after her, young folks. She inspired SNCC. She said, you need to start this organization. Yes, there is other organizations, but you all need to have your own organization. And so Mama Ella Baker is definitely someone I look up to. And then Fannie Lou Hamer was just an amazing, fearless, powerful woman who is from the Delta of Mississippi, who went all the way to the Atlantic City Democratic Convention and said, not today, not today. She you know, helped found the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, did electoral politics, you know, uh, worker organizing, and and you know, she she said one of my favorite quotes is, "I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired." Yeah. So those are the two people I look up to on a day-to-day -day basis. Thank you, Nalini. Thank you so much. I Nalini really Stamp it. from the Working Families Party. Uh, you can check them out online. We'll have all the links below on YouTube. If you're watching on YouTube, if not, go to YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> all right, I'm Nomi Kans. This is TYT Politics for the Young Turks. Thanks.